so let's move on. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Lisa Wilson. Uh, she has uh, kindly accepted our invitation and she has flown down from uh, uh, Hawaii, uh, Honolulu. Uh, and so we, we, are, uh, we express our uh, thanks, sincere thanks to Lisa. Uh, she teaches philosophy at the University of Hawaii. At Manoa or? Manoa. yeah, Manoa. And uh, she specializes on uh, aesthetics and epistemology. And today her uh, presentation is entitled Emotion Concepts for Virtue Theory From Aesthetic to Epistemic and Moral. I don't know whether you have slightly changed the title of the presentation. Um, I don't think I've changed it. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> so please, please. Okay. Um, actually, I'd, I'd first like to. You know, I have three people to thank, first of all, and um, the first one is, is Professor Shefali Montra for your talk on um, the board. Because, um, first of all, this is now my um, Parma Guru, my teacher's teacher, which I found out about. And also because um, she she um, spoke about this incredible essay um, on personality. Right? Um, and so I, I must mention this, because I found a copy of this book in the library at the University of Hawaii. And um, I was in awe because um, it was two years ago, it was 2017. But the book was from 1917. So as I held the book in my hand, it was literally a copy from 1917. It was 100 years old, the oldest book I ever held in my hand. And I'm surprised that I was allowed to check this book out of the library. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but in that book, he, um, he had one chapter was called, there's an essay called um, What is Art? Yeah. And, um, and, and there he makes a comment about what is it that we do when we try to reach out and touch the inevitable. And in that sense, um, I feel so nervous and intimidated because um, I could never possibly cover this topic, knowing that what is that inevitable? It's, it's us, and we can't really wrap our heads around it. We are. So um, thank you for bringing me back to that. And, um, and so what it me meant to me as I read that was that I, I thought I found a source exactly for virtue theory when I read that. Because I said, as he's talking about personality, he's touching upon the matter of character. And I think that's something that we're all coming back to here, is what, you know, how character is central to whatever way you want to picture virtue, we have to bring in the notion of character in one way or another. And, and then I thought to myself, even this, this beautiful building, which we think of as, most of us think of as an inanimate, it has so much character. And in part, there's been so much experience here. And we use our imaginations to try to grasp that. And we never fully do. It becomes a sort of aesthetic experience. So that's what I'm here to talk about today, is how that's useful for us in virtue theory, um, aesthetic experience, and emotion. Um, I also wish to thank Professor Rontate. I'm actually dumbfounded with honor to be here. So um, thank you. And um, also a special thanks to Professor Sri Chitanji Shikhar for inviting me, but even more for the lesson that I learned in his book, Ethics in the Maharat. And there, I learned about, more importantly, the truth, there's kind of two different notions of truth, one of which is about becoming, Arita. And um, this pertains to my philosophical question, because my project is really about, actually, is this, um, it looks like, It's like, um, yeah, I don't know if it's going to be. Mm, uh, something. Something's off with this. Yes, yes, yes. I don't know. Um, oh, um, maybe you open up the. Mm -hmm. Is the PowerPoint on? Okay. Well, anyway, so. Um, you can't see it. Yeah. Oh, wow. You can be sized with it. Yes, ma'am. That's better. Can you do it? No, no, no. Never mind. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe what I'll have to do is. Go with this and I'll read out to you what's better. Okay, yeah. So you just go with it. So um, anyway, so my project began um, not as somebody who teaches virtue theory um, with hesitation because um, what I want to say is, um, and I, as I tell my students, is that I'm not good per se, but I want to be better. I'd like to be better. And, um, and my research project is really about. Aesthetic. So as I was reading Nakhya Shastra and Nakhya Prati, um, of course the main focus is on Rahasa Sutra. And the, this is the central focus of everybody who reads the text and, and 
most of the time is what I'm focusing on as well, is the particulars of that. But there's a line right before the Pasta Sutra, and, um, and this is where the concept of Pritha comes in. It says, the line is, Nahi Vasad Pritha Kash Chid Artaha Pramartate. And what it means is, is that no meaning proceeds without pasta. There's no meaning that comes forth without pasta. And um, this is this is the, my philosophical question, and it's the question that I'm addressing as I investigate particular rasas. In particular, I'm investigating um, karuna because it's so important in so many different ways, and especially for virtue ethics. Adbuta wonder, which is about philosophical inquiry and is the heart of both philosophical inquiry and aesthetic enjoyment, and Hasya, which I will save for another day. But um, Hasya about the even the epi there's there's even some epistemic value for us there, which I think will fit into a, a theory of virtue. Okay, so um, considering that I won't get all the way through this presentation on the paper. I'll just go straight to the very end. <laughs> and then, um, you know, yes, once again, you can't read the text. Uh, but once again, and I'll give you a, a quote from one of, one of my favorite poets, Baba Buki. Um, and there, in this quote, sorry, sorry, um, Tomas is a play, actually, Butora um, Ramachrita. And there, um, Tomas makes a comment. She says, Oh, Sambira. I mean, how confusing. Eko rasa ha karuna eva nitta vidad finna ha pritak pritad eva shayate vivartan avarta buddha taranga mayan vikaranam boya ta salivam eva tu tat samagam. And really, that's one rasa, karuna, divided by a diversity of causes undergo different variations as water assumes different conditions of eddy, bubbles, and waves. And it's all nevertheless but water. So I bring this up because um, I bring this up because um, Karuna should have, if we were going to do a comparative philosophy of of emotions and virtue theory, Karuna should be the most relevant of all. It has the greatest resemblance to Aristotle's conception of pathos. Okay, and pathos will find this not only at the heart of his aesthetic theory, it's also um, part and parcel of his theory of virtue. And um, he himself was never, he never connected it in his own writings, what the relationship is there. But um, the story is quite different in Rasa theory where we have a, a strong um, distinctions between specific kinds of emotions and how um, how um, how our ordinary compassion is connected to aestheticized compassion. So I should first give you a little bit of actually Aristotle's view. I won't go through my whole paper. And like I said, I surely will be able to um, finish, but and I will save my Shemender quotes for another day. <laughs> um, that's not impossible. Okay. All right. Well, huh. okay. So, well, anyway, um, let me go on. Okay, Aristotle's view. In the sense that there is an ethics of how to know the world, theory of knowledge has a normative dimension, and virtue theory addresses the emotion problem in epistemology because it requires to be an active agent who embodies dispositions to inquire and cultivate character traits that lead to epistemic virtue, or wisdom, in the <coughs> Aristotle. So Aristotle discusses two kinds of virtue in Nicomachean Ethics, um, book two, virtues of thought and virtues of character. So this is how I came into this picture, is not so much as a, an ethicist, but as a virtue epistemologist. <laughs> Um, virtue for him, but they're connected, it is a state that is willed, meaning that it involves free will, which consists in a mean relative to the individual, meaning that it's never an extreme, defined by reference to reason as a prudent or intellectual person would define it. So it involves a sense of propriety, too. I've had this quote by um, the aesthetician, uh, 
Shivendra, who claims that propriety is um, the mark of uh, bringing about prasa. Okay, so of course, for Aristotle, practical virtue is supposed to be habitual, meaning that the term this has to do with some scars, but also in terms of feeling, um, meaning there's always an emotional component in every virtue, according to Aristotle. And Aristotle actually has a precise definition of virtues here. You know, it's a mean between two extremes, it's willed, and it involves a motivational component, which is a kind of an emotion. Okay, and a virtuous state is no mere feeling either, because feelings do not determine goodness or badness. Finally, insofar as emotions function as a motivational component, a virtually constituted character virtue is no mere disposition either. It has to be exercised. If you don't exercise the virtue, you don't have it. It's not like we have a bunch of dispositions that are good, but we never get a chance. To, if we don't get a chance to exercise them, then they're never, they're never virtues. As such, even practical virtue is dependent upon some intellectual virtue to determine its propriety. The trickiness of developing virtue for him means that being, good, being a good judge, important, requires having as broad of a possible of education. At the same time, education should be specialized like medical treatment. So he makes certain things, he makes the, the mean and moderation and exercise of virtues relative to the individual, but it's not a form of relativism. You know, and it brings an emotion without making emotion per se the deciding factor. And this is something I think a lot of virtue ethicists and epistemologists like to hang on to in Aristotle's theory. So one must learn how to habituate emotions by taking pleasure in moderation and in the right objects, a difficult task. So in Aristotle's theory, channeling emotions may also have a relation to aesthetic appreciation and emotional balancing because in theater, emotions are aroused and channeled in catharsis. So what happens in the theater, according to Aristotle, is that we kind of drum up emotions. We um, respond to certain things that we see, and it brings about pathos, and someone thinks to themselves, ah, you know, that, that could just as well be me. And then a certain emotion arises, such as fear, or um, perhaps even, not really anger so much, but um, um, definitely, Compassion, and as you know, Father Luthi was pointing out, this emotion is, emotion is fluid. Emotion is fluid, so one emotion transforms into another, and and then, according to Aristotle, emotions are channeled out in the theater. So they're drummed up, and the excess emotions that shouldn't be there, that causes us to be out of balance and throw off our virtuous disposition, those are channeled out so that we can function better later on. Now, the interesting thing is that he didn't really connect so much his theory of theater emotions with his theory of ethical emotions. And, and this is a problem in part because he doesn't have a separate theory of different kinds of emotions. He doesn't have a theory of aesthetic emotions versus personal emotions. Okay. And this has created a lot of uh, controversies and paradoxes in, in Western literature, um, that, such as the paradox of emotion in fiction. Whereas people wonder, is how is it emotions in theater can be um, rational? And especially since they're seen in Western theory as personal emotions. Well, as soon as we see them as distance and depersonalized emotions, we can see them in a different light. Okay, so, so aestheticized emotions, the concept of Ross is involved, it pertains to the essence of something perceptible or flavor. As a description of aesthetic enjoyment, it's similar in kind to a kind of immersion experience, swadana, or tasting in Sanskrit. The Rasa Sutra, the Natya Shastra, Tatra, Ibhava, Anubhava, Vyabhcharabhava, Samyuga, Vasaha, Nishpati, omits reference to stable personal emotions or stadi bhavas. So those stable personal emotions are the emotional dispositions that Aristotle was talking about. Yet the Rasa Sutra omits that. Um, and it's only, it, the Rasa Sutra only picks out the conjunction of the necessary conditions or determinants, consequences, and the transient states that are depicted in aesthetic experience and produce aesthetic pleasure. So Rasa, of course, is the aesthetic enjoyment of um, usually people who think eight or nine specific emotions, the Sringara, the Erotic, Karuna, Compassion, Abhuta, 
wonder, Ibaka, disgust, Bionica, terror, Padra, anger, Mira, the heroic, and my favorite, Hasya comedy. <laughs> but also, importantly, Rasa is not, according to you know, all of you, especially Abhina Gupta, who will make this point very clear, it is not the actual emotion of artist, musician, or poet causally responsible for their creation. So it's not a kind of personal emotion, even if personal emotions are what's inspired in artistic production. So we can picture Rasa to be reflected through there being distance form of aesthetic judgment. Yet the Rasa experience is a special kind of experience someone can become absorbed in. And my point is, is to borrow these theory, to borrow these insights from centric poetics and theory theory of emotions, which is now going to be commonly known as Rasa theory in a wide array of contexts, and do both. See, see process or aestheticized emotions as an immersion experience and one about which we can make a judgment, but not just any kind of a judgment. Not a determinate judgment about things, it's a reflective judgment or a judgment of taste. And I do prefer to picture it as a judgment of taste in the Kantian sense. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that. But first let me just finish up with a general picture of process theory. So in an aesthetic production, we often refer to artistic representations as the objects of art. The objective features of performance, literary, and still art that are such that the causal conditions of aesthetic experience, and these are the Thibadas, etc., the Baba Di, so I just consider that as the, the core of the Hasa Sutra is the Thibada Di, and then there's the Samyoga, which brings these things together. Um, so the Thibada are, of course, the uh, just the objects that we see, and um, the Anubhava is experiences which should follow after that. Um, the Avacharabhava are these fleeting emotions that fit in in a proper sense. And, that's what, and when these come together in the right way, when there's a conjunction, they give rise to Rasa. Okay, so the Vivavadi are causally, they're considered to be actual causes. Like objects are causes in the world, Vivavadi are causes in aesthetic experience imaginative causes. So on one plane, in personal emotions, we have things that cause us pain, like the rock or the monkey that grabbed my cherries one day. You know, that was, that was a cause, <laughs> you know, that caused me to have wonder and fear. Um, but when I see something like this in the, the theater, it, it's also a cause, but it's a different kind of a cause. It's a viva. It's not, just not a cause in every, isn't it? So it's an imaginative cause. And they're causally geared toward facilitating an embodied judgment. So because we have reflexes and such that we respond, we, we do respond to imaginative causes in an embodied way. And then part of my paper talks quite a bit about embodied judgments and news problems theory of emotions as judgments of value and importance, but of course I don't even have time to go into that right now, and I'll just skip over that part. But on this matter, the conjunction of the Samyoga and the Rasa Sutra occurs in the embodied imagination of the spectator. And that's one of the most important things to get across, which I hope to get across to Western aestheticists, so that they can understand how this distinction really solves some problems for us, some philosophical problems. And, and then, um, and as um, Prata says, actually, he, he comments on this, he, he seems to say that with the conjunction, a certain fittingness of a quality, he uses the word puma, to be universalized is a sufficient condition for asa. I think he, he, he uses the word universal to samanya puna again. So there's a certain fittingness of something we see that can be universalized. And this has a parallel in Aristotle's aesthetic theory because he also thinks that we, uni we universalize a possibility and when we say that that could be me and it generates compassion. Um, so on this point, of course, Prata puts this um, most beautifully because he explains how Rasa experience pervades the body as fire consumes dry wood when a discourse of the heart ensues. So this is how it starts to affect our emotions. So he says, Avati chatra shlokaha, there's a shloka on this, yo arpa hridaya sambari pasya vavo vaso bhavaha sharam ya in turn, Avinava describes the function 
of the BLRD in producing aesthetic enjoyment as being different from that of ordinary cause and effect, and of course, ordinary cause of an emotion is a positive causation, which determines objects as such, right? And then, this is important, the BLRD serve as negative function, removing obstacles for the mind to touch upon the constitutive dispositions of the subject. Right. So this is one of the most important things that um, we can we can use in aesthetic theory is an idea that we already are composed of this aesthetic enjoyment, but it's already something that we have in us. We already have um, emotions that constitute us, um, and it's about but but having access to aesthetic enjoyment is another matter. So what what the aesthetic objects do is they strip away, when we can engage with them, they strip away the obstructions to aesthetic experience. These are obstacles. And there are actually seven obstacles, such as being unfit. When you see something, you say that's impossible, that could have never happen. I think that when I see sci-fi movies, but also um, there's also spatial temporally situating the aesthetic object. And that's part of my own inability to um, be able to appreciate certain kinds of art is that I start thinking about when did this possibly happen? You know, could that happen? You know, where where could this space movie ever happen? Or most importantly, what most of us do is obstructions to a set of experience. We personalize it. We see something. It reminds us of something important to us. Let's say you know, I see a, um, a sad a sad movie, or I, I read a sad poem. And I think about my own personal experience of loss with my grandmother or something like that. And that personalized experience is no longer an aesthetic experience. It's now a personal experience. Okay. A lot of people, and I think this is maybe perhaps one of the big challenges for us as teachers, is to um, um, get to with our students this failure of empathetic imagination. You know, um, it seems like now, you know, don't we ask ourselves all the time, we ask our students all the time, to use our, use our imaginations when we want to understand something better. Right? So failure of empathetic imagination could be an obstacle. The, the aesthetic object being unclear or irrelevant or inciting doubt could this have ever happened are also obstacles. So what then? What if all these obstacles were stripped away? And perhaps not in whole. Perhaps we can only strip away at times these obstacles in part. Well then, according to the Hasa theories, this process of chamakara. And this is um, actually um, Rastogi's picture of how um, Chamatkari is, he has an essay called The Quintessentiality of um, the Chamatkari Experience. It's become an interesting thing, I think there's some Sanskritists who are actually investigating this with Chamatkara to find out really what the origin of this. And it definitely has something to do with aesthetic wonder because they also, um, in, when you look at the literature, you see that it comes up in conjunction with the term Adhuta Boga a lot. So um, Chamatkara, which is with this term of, first of all, just like consuming something. And that's like what we do when we go into theater. It is a form of consumption. But that's just the basic level. Then there's this next level where it becomes um, enjoyment of just some kind of art. Um, but at some point, if the obstacles begin to get stripped away, it becomes an experience of pure subjectivity. Because we're not objectifying things. We're not saying this is a pers personal emotion. And when we do say that we, we do personalize the experience, what happens is we make subject object distinctions. So whenever we're not able to appreciate an aesthetic experience, and because it becomes something personal, like I'm thinking about my grandmother. My grandmother's an object in that sense, and I'm a subject. But here, where there's a loss of like that's not about anybody in particular, it's not about anybody in space and time. So the experience is not an objective one, it's actually purely subjective at which point it becomes a reflective experience because there is still an object there, an object of art. It's just not fully determined because it's not about anything. And, and this is where we get um, aesthetic experience. Okay. So the quintessential term for has enjoyment, chamatkara, is supposed to be the experience of unobstructed consciousness. This rest in the self and pleasure of aesthetic experience is metaphorically referred to as repose in the heart of Vishwanti. As, Abhi, as um, Mahajan Vastogi explains all in this theory, it's the state of refined consciousness. You can see it not necessarily as a 
positive mystical achievement, but as this rational elimination of those seven factors. Okay. And interestingly enough, although all aesthetic you know, um, immersion begins in this kind of wonderment of sorts, because it's at the heart of aesthetic pleasure, it has a parallel in philosophy where we, you know, in the Theotetus, um, Socrates says to Theotetus, um, all philosophy begins in wonder. So while um, aesthetic wonder, you know, um, may also be a counterpart to Descartes' primal notion, which sits at the heart of inquiry, Descartes also had a theory of emotions which were, which were strictly personal. And in his theory of emotions, wonder was the very first emotion. Wonder is the source of every other emotion. The very first thing we do is we, is we question something. Before we make a determination about is this good, is this bad, do I love it, do I hate it, there's a sense of wonder about something. And, um, and this gives rise to a kind of inquiry, although Descartes thinks we don't ever want to get stuck there, because we'll just be gaping around at what a beautiful place this is, you know, all the time. And he didn't have this distinction between aesthetic size emotions and, and, um, and personal emotions. Okay. So anyway, I'm just going to actually go through this really quick, because I don't have much time left. And, and that's the start of the theory tell you the truth, there's so much more to say about it, but this is really just a, a beginning and a kind of outline of how we can make a distinction um, between aestheticized emotions and personal emotions, and how this will be important in some sense, because um, because in ethics, what are we doing? <laughs> okay, so there's these factors in lost experience, and I could go over that, but most important here is that at, at one point, at that last stage, where there is enjoyment, there is supposed to be, there's a of loss of separateness. Because we're not making subject-object distinctions, there's this loss of separateness. And in that, while being distanced, we're in a special kind of a state of mind. Okay. Now, of course, Kant pictured this as you know, what, what we're talking about. And I struggled with this, fitting this in with Kant's theory, because at one point I thought it would never work. Kant says, he specifically says, you can't have sentiments in a judgment of taste. Why? He says, because it personalizes it. He says, you can't have a sentiment in an aesthetic experience because then it would be personal. But wait a minute. These are different kinds of sentiments. And actually, it, it does fit in a particular way. Um, so it also maps on pretty well to the way we, we picture the term pasta as a, something that um, means taste or judgment taste. And the central feature of Kant's aesthetic theory is that involve aesthetic attitude that's disinterested or detached from all liking and all disliking and selfish concern for personal gain or loss. That doesn't mean that character is lost in what we're doing. It doesn't mean that we're no longer involved. But um, the aesthetic attitude con you know, constituent of beauty is characterized by this free play of imagination and understanding. And that's where we have a chance to change. Because in this free play of imagination and understanding is is also engaging with our emotional way of being in the world. We begin to picture emotions in a different way. And how is that? Well, <laughs> well, it's, it's just, you know, interesting enough. As Kant pictures it, first of all, he thinks that, you know, as we say that um, aesthetic experience is subjective, but in some sense, he sees it as universal because it comes with an expectation, like when I adjust something that's beautiful, we look to each other and we say, you ought to see that rose is beautiful too, right? Um, but then, but it's, but it's also purely subjective in the sense that there's no object, it's not, and when I'm having an aesthetic experience of a rose, I'm not determining anything that's a rose, I'm determining beautiful, which isn't determined at all. It's, you know, I can't see it otherwise, it's necessary that I see it that way, it has a normal, and, and I can like art, you know, that I, know to be trash, and I can say, well, it's necessary I don't see it that way. You know, I've, I've got something wrong there. So there's this normative dimension to it. Or I can say that I know that something is really, really good. It's necessary that I see it as beautiful, like a horror film that is perfect. I can't appreciate it because my personal emotions don't allow me to appreciate horror films. But I necessarily see that it's an object of art, and I can judge it as beautiful. And finally, it's detached and devoid of personal interests. 
Um, I had, uh, I've gone through a little, in my longer version of the paper, I've gone through a little bit of um, um, issues with um, how um, detachment comes in to be a, a really big issue. But anyway, there's one person in particular, Edward Bola, who's, who's done some work um, on psychic detachment. And he's argued that it's precisely by distancing ourselves from personal emotion that art allows us to experience a fuller range of human emotions more than any one of us could otherwise experience in his or her opportunity life, and certainly would ever want to. So being able to access other emotions imaginatively brings us into a different sphere where we can have compassion for others in some other way. So he says that there's maybe about um, a, f a few different kinds of act actually aesthetic distance, but it's produced by putting this phenom art phenomena, so to speak, out of gear with our practical actual selves by allowing it to stand outside of the context. Yeah. By allowing it to stand outside of the context of our personal needs and then by in short, by looking at it objectively, but not determining the object, and it has, as it often calls. Okay, in the second stage, by permitting only such reaction on our part that emphasizes certain objective features. Um, and then interpreting our subjective affections not as mode of being, but rather as characteristics. And then what happens to the audience, when we're looking at something, we have a not so merely personal stance compared to the merely personal emotions in everyday life. And this proper distancing must be moderated against the extremes of, according to Bull, over distancing and under distancing. And this is really important because it also maps onto Aristotle's theory and the theory of equanimity. You can't be too close to it, but you also can't be too detached. Too much detachment is like a serial killer who's doing totally wrong things. Too much closeness is somebody who can't, you know, separate themselves from their personal loss. So there's this aesthetic detachment that's kind of in between and difficult to get to. And he discussed actually five different kinds of distancing, some that's generated by cutting out the practical side of things, distances between characters and fiction in the audience, between art and reality, distance between the artwork itself and the audience, and distance between the artist and inspired work. And in all of these forms of distance, there's some aspects of the spatial temporal distancing that Avinella speaks of in describing the Hase experience because, he says, it's not attached to space and time, rendering a laukika rather than laukika. And on this particular point, I, I owe a great deal of gratitude to Professor Arvindam Chakrabarthi, who has an incredible essay called Ownerless Emotions, where he brings up Vishpanatha, another um, aesthetic theorist in Sanskrit, who, who says, mine, but not just mine. You know, they're, you know, everyone, but not just any, you know, anyone's. So whose is this lost experience? It belongs to everybody and no one. And so these emotions he calls ownerless. And this concept of ownerless emotions becomes key for understanding the aesthetic concept of compassion and how it can be important for changing our emotional dispositions. But like I said, you know, I mean, the very first slide I had was by R.K. Sen, who said, yeah, yeah, art makes us good, but first we have to be good. <laughs> so until we can have a little bit of system and do some hard work, I'm not, you know, I'm still trying. I'll stop there. Otherwise, I'll... I think Lisa uh, deserves a special thanks for for covering uh, a very important issue which has not been discussed in our earlier presentations. Right. She finally uh, kept on uh, talking about emotion, emotion. Uh, she also and imagination. Her, yeah, and imagination. So Lisa has uh, has uh, has. Uh, you know, uh, made justice to that. So thank you, Lisa. Um, uh, and and I, as far as I can uh, understand, uh, this is a very beautiful example of, of uh, placing philosophy of emotion in the context of larger uh, uh, um, area of virtue ethics, where she starts from you know, the famous Rasa Sutra, uh, and then you know, uh, 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 passing over to Aristotle and then to Kant. And, and I'm sorry that I had to uh, cut her short because of uh, 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 we have a, we have a Skype presentation uh, by Professor uh, Michael Slope uh, after a while. So but anyway, thank you, Lisa. And so we can I think spend around five to eight minutes for uh, question answer or if you have any comments, please come forward. So you say you seem to have convinced everybody. What comes up in my mind is this, that uh, these philosophers who have done Alankaru, especially Obhinavagupta, uh, 
they are also doing some kind of uh, monistic metaphysics. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Abhinav Gupta was a Pashti Shaito philosopher. And uh, this Rakshas uh, group, uh, it is also very closely tied up with the Upanishad, huh. where Brahman Matthew from himself yes. is called Raso Bhaisa. It's a tasting of comments. This is what they say. Bhattanayaka, I think, is quite a key crystallization in tasting. But, um, sorry, um, I, one thing I didn't get a chance to discuss is that this, the, you know, whichever theories we look at, you know, whether we're looking at Prata or Ad, and there's differences between Prata and Abhinav Gupta. Um, the main point is, is that it connects them is they both and even uh, Bhattanayaka. So between all these these three theories that pretty much cover every possibility you could get to, they all take advantage of Sankhya metaphysics. Meaning that what we have is we have a tripartite theory of emotions and not just a dualistic one that's, different, that's considered in terms of active, passive distinctions. That there's always some element of activity and pleasure in this. And sattva is supposed to be predominant, you know, but of course, Likened to um, the taste yes, of the Yes, Obinam uh, Kutu yeah. uh, is just subscribing to an entirely different conception of consciousness. Hmm. Where consciousness is hmm. conceived as something which is essentially creative. Hmm. Just as a, even a principle of illumination or principle of manifestation. Hmm. Uh, instead of just viewing it as Swami Jyoti. As one for Kashu, uh, it is being uh, conceived as Swatantra, hmm. uh, yes. uh, capable of creating the universe from within itself. Yeah. Isn't it? Beautiful. Uh, that is perhaps the main key uh, to understanding. This yes, for, for me and you, yes, but for no, but for our, the, the people that need this distinction, that have problems in aesthetics, that aren't able to solve it, then this aspect is, it's it's not necessary to bring in this aspect. The, the theory of depersonalized emotions itself is useful for solving problems in aesthetic, and that's the main thing I'm trying to do here. Although I absolutely agree with you and I appreciate that to a great extent. Thank you. In Abhinav Gupta, hmm. when he's talking about consciousness, he also speaks about its two aspects, Shiva and Shakti. Hmm. Yes, and yes, also, yes, yes, yes. And yes, I think yes, yes. we say, yeah, actually there are very similarity between Abhinav Gupta and Arvinda, hmm. because he also speaks about Chit and Chit Shakti. And in fact, in his very text, The Light Divine, here he says, that Shiva and Shakti, they are one and the same. Mm -hmm. um, R.K. Stan in his book, Aesthetic Enjoyment, calls it about um, Shakti Sadhana. It's what he calls it Aesthetic Enjoyment. It is very, very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, I think with this, uh, we have to end this session. We again thank uh, Lisa uh, for uh, joining us and for I know, uh, making a beautiful presentation. And thank you for all for joining us uh, here. So, uh, is there any announcement? Well, uh, we have to, um, we, uh, we should reassemble here uh, for Michael Slope Skype uh, keynote speech at 6.30. Um, uh, I think uh, we should be here uh, when well, I'm reminding myself in at least five minutes prior to that. So, um, in Skype, uh, Communication can start right at 6 days. And after that, then we will be special topics for dinner. And what's the plan? Well, dinner is at 8.30. 8.30? Well, yeah, I mean, they. So there are two dinners. 8 o'clock, I'm sorry, 8 o'clock, I think. Well, what can we do? This is how he could, we could accommodate him. This is the only way we could be accommodated. Sure. The feeling and the emotion and the motive and the virtue side of compassion can't actually be separated, and so I don't think there really is a problem of ambiguity. Now I have to show you why I think that. So let's talk about uh, compassion uh, as a motive. You want to help someone uh, who needs your help. 
they're suffering and you want to uh, you want to help them all right now let's say your reason for wanting to help them is that you think it's your duty of them okay that's not compassion let's say you think oh I'll make the world a better place if I help them. Again, that's not compassion. When compassion is really your motive, you are feeling with the other person. You are empathizing with their suffering. And so I think something really doesn't count as compassion uh, as a motive, as, as that particular motive, unless it involves a kind of empathic feeling with the other person. The real interesting question, though, is does it work in the reverse direction? Does empathy with the suffering or distress of another person necessarily mean that you're going to want to help them? Those English-speaking psychologists and philosophers who have discussed empathy treat empathy as conceptually quite separate from the desire to help other people. They think, oh, yes, you could have empathy for their suffering, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you want to help them. Some years ago, I discovered what I think is a reason for believing this to be a mistake. I think the connection between empathy and the desire to help is much more intimate than the Western psychologists have realized. So let me try to explain to you my reasons for saying that. Um, let's say somebody is uh, distressed by the pain in their arm. Okay. Uh, well. And then let me back up just for a moment. In general, empathy involves feeling what another person feels, but also with respect to what they feel it about. Let's say, for example, that I am a father and my daughter loves stamp collecting. She's enthusiastic about stamp collecting. If she, I am infected by her enthusiasm for stamp collecting, that's an empathic process. But it involves more than just generalized enthusiasm. It involves enthusiasm about stamp collecting. So in general, empathy involves feeling the other feels with respect to what they're feeling in fact, with respect to stamp collecting, in the case of my daughter. Well, let's transpose the case to, to the case I started with, where we have somebody who is distressed by the pain in their arm. Okay? Now, to be distressed by something is to want to eliminate it or lessen it, right? So this person who's distressed by the pain in their arm wants to alleviate, wants to lessen, wants to do away with that pain in their arm. Okay, so I come along and have empathy with their distress. Well, given the terms I mentioned earlier, that means that I'm distressed not just uh, in general, but about the pain in their arm. That's what I share with them. Just as my daughter's love of stamp collecting is something I share with her, so the distress about this pain is what I share with the person who is distressed and suffering. Well, if I'm distressed by the pain in their arm, then I want to alleviate or lessen or do away with it, which means I have a motive to help them. So by its very definition, if I am empathic with the distress someone is feeling about the pain in their arm, I, by definition, conceptually, have a desire to relieve that pain. So I'm saying that the two sides of compassion, the empathy feeling side and the motivational helping side, are absolutely, inexorably, necessarily bound together. And then you might ask, well, what is the virtue of of, 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 of compassion. It constitutes the very fact that I've just mentioned, that these two sides, the healing side okay, and the motivational side, are bound together. That is the virtue of compassion. So I think all the sides of compassion are not ambiguous in relation to each other. Actual, actually are uh, one phenomenon with different sides, and there's no ambiguity. Uh, I can use the word compassion to refer to the feeling side or, with refer, or, or to refer to the motive side. And there's no problem because those two sides are necessarily linked. Now, you might ask, what does this have to do with Chinese philosophy? Now I'm going to bring in the Chinese philosophy. 
Um, and I'm going to bring in particular, in, uh, in, partic in particular, the ideas of yin and yang. Now, I, I guess everyone knows those concepts, but they're sort of vague, and no one ever tries to translate them. Okay? And there are actually two traditions of thinking about yin and yang within China. One of them treats yin and yang as opposites, as contraries. For example, uh, yin is dark and yang is bright. Yin is wet and yang is dry. Yin is uh, cold and yang is warm. Yin is um, acid and yang is alkaline. Now, these contrasts worked in traditional Chinese thinking as ways of explaining natural phenomena. To give you one rather obvious and clear-cut example, the Chinese thought that the yang of a bright sunshine day had to eventually be replaced by darkness. That yin and yang were opposites, but that they, the one pushed out the other, so that the uh, darkness of yin would push out the brightness of sunshine. Now, these kinds of explanations, in terms of yin and yang, are outmoded. Modern science doesn't make use of this sort of thing. And for that reason, uh, yin and yang as, as physical opposites, dark and light, warm and cold, uh, became a very unpopular idea in Chinese philosophy. In popular culture, there is still a lot of talk about the opposites. In Chinese medicine, in feng shui, okay, in macrobiotic diets. But the Chinese philosophers gave up on this idea. They didn't think it was scientific enough. And I agree with them. However, there is another tradition of thinking about yin and yang within Chinese thought. That other tradition doesn't see yin and yang as opposites. It sees yin and yang as complementary. In fact, as necessarily complementary. Now, one illustration of this that you can see on the internet is the way yin and yang uh, are depicted uh, you know, in, in a kind of diagram. You have this large circle, and inside, are two curvy half circles. One of them is dark, that's the in dark half circle, but within it, as you look at the internet, there's a little space of light, okay? So the light is the young. So the dark yin half circle contains young brightness in its center. And by the same token, the, uh, the young half circle of brightness contains a little half circle, contains a little circle of, of, of yin darkness. So yin and yang are thought of as complementary to each other. Each exists containing an element of the other. Uh, and they're not opposites at all, they are complementary. Perhaps the best anticipation of this idea is in the uh, Chinese thinking about heaven and earth. Uh, Chinese, the Chinese think that heaven is yang uh, and earth is yin. They don't think of these as opposites. They think heaven and earth have to work together and that each is really incomplete without the other. So I want to pro propose a conception of yin and yang in which these things uh, are complementary and each one necessitates and requires and includes the other. So how do you do that? Well, my proposal in some of my recent work, for example, in the book, The Philosophy of Yin and Yang, which was published last year by the commercial press in Beijing, my proposal is that we understand yin as receptivity and yang as directed purpose, or in a larger way, as directed impulsion. Now, Receptivity already contains a young element of activity within it because receptivity is different from passivity. Receptivity is already being eager to contain something from outside. It's reaching out to the outside. So you can see already that, uh, that the yin of receptivity has a young side to it. And I could so show you the same about the young of directed purpose. It has a yin side to it too. 
Now let's look back at what we were saying, or what I was saying, about, um, about compassion. I said that the empathy feeling side of compassion necessitates the motivational side and vice versa. Well, the empathy feeling side of compassion is receptive. When you are empathizing with another, you're receptive to their reality, their mental, psychological reality. So the feeling side of compassion is yin. And the motivational side, to help the other, to relieve their distress, at the pain in their arm or wherever, that's yang. That's direct active purpose. Since these two sides of compassion are necessarily connected, that illustrates the way in which, in the Chinese tradition I've spoken of, yin and yang are indissolubly linked. Necessitate each other, cannot be separated. So I think we can understand the virtue of compassion, also the virtue of benevolence, also virtues like gratitude and others. We can understand them as having a kind of yin-yang structure in which they involve, conceptually involve, both receptivity and directed purpose in necessary interconnection. Okay? All right, now, having said as much, let me go on to another issue. Let me go beyond virtue ethics and talk a little bit about the mind in general. There's a difference between Indian thinking about the mind and Western thinking about the mind, as opposed to both of them, as opposed to Chinese uh, or even Japanese thinking about the mind. Um, the Chinese have a concept of Shin which is not usually translated mind, but rather heart-mind, because the Chinese think they cannot separate, they cannot separate um, cognition and reasoning and thinking from all emotion. Now, in the West, it's assumed that these things can be separate, that someone can be thinking, well, the light went off in my office and I have to shake my arms and make the light go back on. <laughs> Any, anyway, um, so, the, um, so the, the Chinese think that you cannot separate cognition and emotion, and in recent years I've come to think that they were correct about that. So let me explain what I think is correct, and how this leads to a yin-yang understanding of how the mind or the heart mind operates. Okay, first, um, Philosophers in the West who think that the mind can be and its operations can be separated from emotion would take belief as a perfect example. Can't you believe something? Can't you believe something without having any emotion, just as a purely cognitive fact? That's the assumption, West, I believe, mistake. Because my dictionary says that confidence that something is the case. It's just strong belief and it's the case. But everyone acknowledges that confidence is an epistemic emotion, okay? And that it's a lesser degree than, for example, certitude. Certitude is a stronger epistemic emotion, okay? Well, on that hierarchy or in that hierarchy, belief is just a less strong cognitive epistemic emotion. So belief is a kind of lesser degree of confidence, and confidence is a kind of lesser degree of certitude. They're all epistemic emotions. So you can't have beliefs without having some degree of epistemic emotion. You can't separate belief from emotion. Now, if you think about the mind's main function, uh, and I can list some of them, uh, the mind uh, makes criticism, it sees things in some ways as, uh, as, as it exemplifies certain qualities, uh, the mind makes inferences, it reasons, it intuits, it has intentions, uh, it acts conscientiously, makes plans. All of these things involve belief. So if belief involves emotion, all the functions of the mind involve, all the functions of the mind involve emotion. So you cannot really separate a functional mind from the having of emotion. Now, how does this bear? How does this bear on yin and 
Well, it, it, it bears in the following way. Uh, let's take any state of the mind which involves, okay, both emotion and um, cognition. So it, let's let's just take thirst, okay? Now, being thirsty is having a desire to drink, but not any desire to drink counts as thirst. If you desire to drink because you want to please your host or hostess, you want to be convivial, that's not thirst. You're not drinking out of thirst. You drink out of thirst when you are when you are receptive to the dryness in your throat or in your body generally. Okay? So there is both a yin side and a yang side, the thirst. With thirst, there is both a receptivity to dryness in the one system, and that is yin, but there's also a desire to drink, a directed purpose, which is yang. So the idea that you can't separate off all the different functions of the mind leads us, I think, to understand that thirst, as an example of a mental process or state, has both yin and yang qualities. Now, I think, in general, that with regard to any functioning mind or heart mind, that its processes and states all involve yin and yang. Let me give you another example. You might say, well, how does belief, believing something is the case, how does that involve uh, both yin and yang? Okay. Well, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example which I think illustrates the point rather nicely. And imagine we're in the 18th century. No phones, no smartphones. We can't order in. Okay. And I'm hungry, and I'm in my house. Okay. And I look around in the cupboard. There were no refrigerators. I look around in the cupboard or in the pantry or wherever, and I say, "This is no food there." What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to go out and look for food, right? Unless, unless the, the walls came in and destroy me, you know. But in general, it's going to impel me to go outside. Now, you might say, well, when you believe that there's no food, you're being receptive to the world around you. You're looking at the world around you, uh, the house around you. And uh, it, so that belief is, is, is a function of one's receptivity to one's environment. Where, you might ask, where is the yang, the directed purpose? Well, look, if it were, if your belief were just a matter of yin receptivity, then you'd believe there was no food in your house, and it wouldn't get you to go out. You'd just have this further belief. My point is that when you're thirsty, uh, uh, when you're hungry, the, the belief that there's no food in the house impels you out of the house. The belief has an act force to it in that context. So what I want to say is, contextually speaking, belief has both a yin side to it and a yang side to it. So I want to say that that um, functional states of the mind, functional processes in the mind, have a yin yang structure. The other side of this, and I'm just going to mention one example, is where the mind is not functional. So let me give you an example where our minds are not being functional. Panic. If someone is in a state of panic, they're precisely not open to or receptive to what actually is happening around them. They're too panicky to realize, for example, that they're no longer in any danger, or that the danger is coming in a different direction from the direction which they are really feared. That panic makes us less than receptive to the world. It also makes us unable to act in a concerted way. If you're in a panic, you can't take effective, uh, concerted, directed steps to help yourself. You're too much in a panic. So I want to say that in states of the mind that are non-functional, we don't get yin, we don't get yang. So I want to say that the, that the notion of a functional mind can be clarified in terms of yin and yang. Now, finally, I get to the specialty of India, epistemology. India was doing outstanding, deep work in epistemology long before the Greeks ever thought of epistemology, probably a thousand years before the Greeks. And the Chinese, I may say, never did epistemology, never were interested in epistemology. 
So there's a long Indian tradition of epistemology, and it really was the first uh, on, uh, on this planet. However, I think, I think that this Chinese distinction between yin and yang can be useful in epistemology to Indian epistemologists, to Western epistemologists. And let me just briefly, as, as, the, uh, um, as the peroration of this talk, explain why I, I, I think that yin and yang can be helpful. You know, we learn about the world by looking around us in, in the first instance. That's the simplest way we learn about the world. We look around us. Okay? And the fact is that human beings are curious. And to be curious about the world around them is a kind of receptivity. For example, let's say I hear a sound to my left. Okay? It's maybe the sound of coffee maker. But I'm curious what's making that sound. Okay? So I look to the left to find out what's there. That's a form of yin receptivity. Right? But think about it a second. When I focused the left, when I pay attention to what's going on to my back, I'm being active. If one is not active, if one lets the world pass across one's screen or vision without focusing, if one lets the world be a blooming, buzzing confusion, to use William James' famous threat, then one's not going to learn anything about the world. A curious person focuses. They may not realize that they're focused. They may not pay attention to the fact that they're paying attention. Paying attention is an act of love, and it directs you. For example, it directs me to the left. See what is making that noise over, over to my left. So the yang of directed purpose, of attention, paying attention, is part and parcel of the yin receptivity of anyone who wants to learn about the world. Yin and yang are involved in the most basic ways in how we learn about the world. Okay, now, if, if I were going to go on with this, I would also tell you how yin and yang can work in the context of scientific explanation. But you be very kind to offer me your attention for the last uh, period, and I think it's time for me to let people in the audience here, there, ask me any questions if they have questions. Thank you. Um, uh, I have a quick question to start with. Um, is <clears throat> you refer to certain instances of suffering which are physical pains, basically. Um, in the Indian tradition, um, there, there are three kinds of suffering that have been uh, taken cognition of. One is physical uh, suffering. Uh, the second one is uh, some, some physical event that gives rise to the suffering. Uh, this could be um, starvation or, uh, as you say, some pain in the body or something. So if I have um, empathy, I try to alleviate that. Uh, the second kind of suffering is accidental reason, I mean, which is not known like tsunami or something. Uh, and the third kind of suffering, suffering is of the mental dimension. Uh, here comes the basic question in the human, uh, in the Indian mind. Uh, this is a traditional question I ask. Like uh, my, the human tendency towards greed, which causes suffering. So how to take care of greed, uh, the Buddha, Others, others before him and others after him, they wanted to free humans of the uh, mental tendencies that give rise to suffering, taking uh, the life in the wrong way that will lead us on to suffering. 
So, so here comes the relevance of spirituality. I'm not talking about religion, spirituality. So this was my, um, I, I wanted to know from you, this is the uh, Indian uh, dimension uh, that insists, or of course the, the, the one who is starving, the he or she, must be given food first. Certainly, that must be taken care of. But if uh, um, uh, uh, empathy is concerned uh, only uh, with alleviating suffering of this kind, well, does that take care of opioid crises or things like that, which is taking over the world all over? Uh, this was my. I, I wanted to uh, point this out. Thank you. Yes, this is a very important question uh, because uh, according to not just Buddhism, but I believe uh, other forms of Indian tradition, there are basic forms of human suffering that are not a matter of being wounded uh, in one's arm uh, or of having too little food or having a brick fall on one's head. Uh, and so they're sort of the basic human condition is unsatisfactory in a certain way. Now, you know, Chinese thought never accepted that idea, but the West has been rather ambivalent. There are a lot of Western thinkers, among them Plato, who think that, yes, the human condition is really not very pleasant or good, and we should try to escape from it into something better. Now, in the, in the case of uh, in the case of Buddhism, it's escaping into uh, nirvana. In the case of Plato, it's actually uh, some kind of com communion with the ideal forms of goodness and beauty and truth. So there are different solutions offered by these different traditions. But I have to tell you, the Chinese have never, uh, at least the, the Confucians, have never uh, really uh, accepted uh, that basic pessimism about the human condition. So here's what I think, and I hope this can be helpful. There is an idea that came out of China about 20 or 30 years ago of the idea of a world philosophy. And the idea of a world philosophy is a philosophy in which the, the main traditions of philosophical thought, India, China, and the West, and we are, I think, the main traditions of philosophical thought on this planet. There wasn't a lot of philosophical thought in Egypt uh, or, in, uh, or in Babylon. Uh, or, 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 or in, uh, in, in, in the new world. So the idea of a world philosophy is that we air our differences and that we communicate about our differences. So I think, I mean, I think that it's time, high time, for Indian and Western and Chinese philosophers to interact more with each other and question like the one you've raised. You know, are the, what did the Chinese say in response to this very deep Indian tradition which is partially also a tradition of Plato and Lewis. So yes, I, I think this is an important question. Well, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> these two days, uh, we have been consciously, uh, we are taking on your idea of a world philosophy. I mentioned at the very beginning that you are insisting on world philosophy and you do what you preach and you might be an exception in that, uh, which I admire in you. So we have been trying to do that. Um, anybody else uh, uh, wants to uh, uh, raise any points, please come over here, please, this point. Why don't you come sit over uh, Our, yeah. Lisa, Lisa's gonna. Okay, Lisa. Lisa from Hawaii is here. Okay. You go there. This way. This way. Sorry. Lisa Wilson. Yeah. Introduce yourself. Hello. Hi, so my name is Lisa. I'm Hi. from the University of Hawaii, Manila, and um, very honored to be talking to you this evening. 
thank you for joining us. Um, my question is about um, the cognitive effect of non-distinction. So you're saying that all of the effective, I mean, all of the cognitive is in fact effective, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, does that make um, all of the effective cognitive as well? Yes. <laughs> I haven't proved that to you, but I, 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 but I do try to to establish that in my yes. So, in that sense, do you see um, all emotions? Well, let me give you let me give you an example of this. I mean, <coughs> if one is afraid, okay, and it's it really is not just some kind of free floating anxiety, then one's afraid of something that threatens one. And one is registering that threat, and that's a cognitive aspect of sure. the uh, of emotion. Sure, that's an emotion, it's a judgment. Um, but what about free floating anxiety? Well, that is a, a good question. Um, in some cases, uh, what, you, what you have with free floating anxiety is uh, a kind of depression. Mm -hmm. Okay? And I do have some things to say about depression. Remember, I, I said to you that uh, functional, or I said to the group that functional states of the moment or of the heart moment uh, have a yin yang dimension, right? But there are also some non functional states. And those non functional states are not yin and they're not yang, and so they lack the cognitive aspect. So I think what we might say about an anxiety, which is just simply a form of, of, of depression, is that it is not a functional state and it, it doesn't really. And what distinguishes it from the functional states is it really lacks a cognitive dimension. Okay. I'm going to think about this for a while. And, but I, I but, like, I like the way the effective is prioritized. So. Oh yes. Now you know. I'll, I'll tell you something. It's a little amusing. Uh, when I, I there was a conference about my work in Hong Kong, and one of the participants, Chinese man, I said, you know, we in China, some of us think that that. The affective is basic to everything. And we call ourselves Chingists. And Ching is the Chinese word for emotion. And so I immediately hopped on the bandwagon and said, well, I'm a Chingist too. Yes, I'm a Chingist. I just want to add a footnote. In Bharata's Natya Shastra, and you gave a presentation on that, uh, Bharata says there is no cognition without rasa. <laughs> And, uh, you know, even when we have philosophical discussions, we have these Eureka moments. Wow, yes, that's yes. a great idea. So I guess that India will go with, uh, Indian philosophy will go with, with that idea. Uh, am, I, am I inaudible? I think, Lisa, you can, trans you can repeat what I said. No, I'm yeah, please, please, please repeat. Yeah, thank you. So, well. so what is he saying is that Prata, the, um, the author of the Natya Shastra is claiming that there um, is no cognition without some affect being involved in that. So, which is kind of a long story, but um, it, where there, there's a precise theory of um, emotions um, in which it's it's kind of an array, a diverse um, spectrum on which we can see it, and that some emotions are more cognitively based than others, but those which are more cognitively based are perhaps um, um, less aesthetic. The ones that are the ones that are not the ones that are more cognitively based, we would look we would less consider to be le less aestheticized. Interesting. Yeah. I find this very interesting. So this shows you again a way in which if we only bring these things out from all our traditions and present them to the other traditions in a world philosophy, we can we can take the riches from the different traditions and test them against each other. I think this is great. Just great. We need somebody finally, not in India, but somewhere, maybe Greece or who knows where, to organize a conference on world philosophy. Do it in India.
I'm hello? Enjoying, I'm enjoying. Okay, hello. Uh, in fact, when from the perspective of Indian ethics, we are trying to give an account of it in the model of virtue ethics. The main problem is how to understand emotion. In fact, emotion, as we get from the Western philosophy, that is also very ambiguous expression. Whether emotion will include feeling, passion, everything. Because from our Indian context, there are various fields of emotion in that sense. Because in Indian philosophy, <coughs> excepting materialist Charbak philosophy, yeah. they, when they speak of life, existence, as full of sorrow, suffering, they presume that because our birth, very existence, huh, is vitiated by certain faults. Now here the idea of faults, dosha, the Sanskrit expression is dosha. And that is responsible for our desire to be born. And so here dosha includes rago, desha, and moha. That is, <coughs> rago, <coughs> roughly speaking, we can translate it as kind of, say, jealousy, envy, or, sorry, rago as kind of attachment, desha as a kind of envy, jealousy, and when we are talking about moho, it is indifference. And these are regarded as passions. We regard these as passions. So the very birth of the individual man is due to these doshas. Now, so here, birth is due to dosha. Now the, my question is that, can we can we understand, translate these passions always in that kind of relational sense as in the case of compassion? Binary in the sense that you, you indicated. Hmm. Uh, but here's what I want to push on. Uh, I think that the emotions like fear or compassion, okay, have a yin-yang structure. Hmm. And I think yin and yang are both desirable features of the universe. Receptivity is a good thing in the world. Uh, directed purpose is a good thing in the world, okay? So where an emotion or a state of the mind has yin-yang structure, there's already something virtuous or rational or good about it. Hmm. Just the opposite, though, would I say about, for example, a panic. Panic doesn't have that yin-yang structure. And I say that's part of how we explain why we don't think panic is good. And there are other states of, of, of our heart which are also not good. For example, I, I mentioned depression. There's also mania. There's also rage. Okay, there's also frenzy. And I would want to argue in each of those cases that there's a failure of yin yang um, structure. And that's how we understand these things as less than uh, desirable. And earlier we are familiar with the content. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can also ask if Sankhya Purush Prakriti is similar to Yin Yang. Good morning, sir. Um, Good morning. I am Ajay, a uh, philosophy scholar from JNU, New Delhi. I have two short questions, one on right. my behalf and one on uh, our director's behalf. So mine is, I want to know a little bit more about this conception of empathy and the way you, sure. uh, the way you uh, related it with com uh, compassion, where you say that if we want to alleviate the suffering of other people, 
then that's the source of uh, compassion. But I was thinking, can we have a notion of empathy or compassion which is directed towards ourselves also? I mean, towards alleviating the suffering of ourselves, as in case of uh, like uh, opioid crisis or any drug crisis, something like that. So how broad is the notion of empathy? Is it uh, exclusively uh, limited to entering into the feelings of others or alleviating the suffering of others or of ourselves also? So that's one question. And uh, well, well, why don't I answer that one first? Okay, sure. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> now, in the literature on empathy, yeah. there is very little, if maybe not even any, talk about compassion or empathy for oneself. So we don't in English talk about compassion for oneself, and we also don't talk about empathy for oneself. So, um, so I, I think the people who have studied empathy talk about it as involving both an identification, but also a certain distance between the empathizer and the person who empathized with. But now you mentioned the opioid crisis, okay? Now, it's important to realize that empathy can take on not only the suffering of one person, but the suffering of a whole group of people. If you hear that a certain group of people are suffering oppression in a, different, in a distant country, you can feel empathy for that general group's terrible situation. So when we deal with social problems, empathy can be involved and engaged because empathy is capable of focusing on larger groups. So it can be expanded. It can be, absolutely. And uh, I refer you to the uh, psychologist Martin Hoffman, Martin. whose book, Hoffman, H-O-F-F-M-N, -F -F okay. Empathy and Moral Development, he, he points out how uh, our empathy can be expanded as we become adolescents. Okay. As we become adolescents. Thank okay, you so your next question. Yeah. yeah, so uh, quickly, I mean, I want to ask, I mean, is there any parallel between, I hope you would be aware of this, uh, this uh, Purush and Prakriti dichotomy which is there in uh, Sankhya Yoga. So is it similar to yin-yang tradition of China or Chinese philosophy? I'm not, what is this, what is the first thing to refer Purusha, to? A purusha and Prakriti, uh, which are the, I mean, opposites of complementary and supplementary. Passive and passive and passive and passive well, you have to tell me more. I don't, know, I don't know enough about Indian philosophy. Can you translate those terms and say just a bit about them? Passive and active. Passive and active. Oh, 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 yes. No, no, I know about that. Yes, passive and active. Yeah, let me explain. I don't, I don't think that's the same as yin and yang. No, no. The Indian tradition does talk about passive and active. I just didn't remember the terms that you, that you use. Passive and active is not the same as yin and yang for two reasons. First of all, for me, uh, it is receptive. And receptive is more active. And passive is not at all active. Okay? Then the, the, the other point is that in the diagram of yin and yang that you see on the internet, the yin has an element of yang in it, the yang has an element of yin in it, but passivity doesn't have an element of activity in it, and activity doesn't have an element of passivity in it. So these are a different, these are a different distinction from the distinction I'm talking about. Maybe Purush and Prakriti also do not have the elements of each other. That's right. That's, that's, that's exactly what exactly. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Michael. Hello. Um, it's a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. Um, my name is Ayan Manaj. Um, I just have, this is one question about the yin and yang in Chinese philosophy, because it's, the way that you understand the terms is resolutely non-metaphysical, it seems to me. Um, is there a way of understanding those concepts? Were they originally metaphysical concepts, yin and yang? Um, and, you know, like, for instance, we, like, who, what's your name? Ajay. Ajay was just talking about Purusha and Prakriti and Sankhya. Those are, those are metaphysical concepts. And they have a, a kind of a complementary relationship. The, you, it seems like you want to use the concept of yin and yang for their complementarity, but minus the metaphysical trappings. And I don't know enough about Chinese philosophy, so it's really a question. I mean, in Chinese philosophy, 
do some Chinese philosophers understand yin and yang as metaphysical concepts, or is it, are they more like terms that just relate to each other? I mean, that's the question. Well, let, let me just say, the Chinese, God help me, the Chinese have actually neglected the concepts of yin and yang in their philosophizing. So it's not as if they're using it for any purpose. For the last 900 years, no Chinese philosopher has men, made any mention of yin and yang. And in recent times, the fact that it seems to go against modern science has made them even less inclined to talk about yin and yang. Okay. But in the tradition of yin and yang, there is a metaphysical element, absolutely. And, okay, and some of it is oppositional, uh, but some of it is also complementary. And I mentioned heaven and earth. Okay. Now, for the Chinese, heaven and earth are a complementarity, not an opposition. But heaven and earth are metaphysical category. Okay. Now, in my own discussion, you have quite rightly noted that there's very little any metaphysical import or content in what I've been saying to you uh, today. However, you uh, have to know that I have been expanding my work on yin and yang so that it takes in metaphysical uh, ideas. Okay, uh, I have been working on that recently. If anyone wants to hear about that or see about that, you can email me. You know, mslode at miami.edu. I'm very happy to share some of that, but you're absolutely right. Yin and yang can be applied metaphysically, but in a form of complementarity. Okay, thank you very much. That's great. Mm -hmm. Good morning, I'm Kumar Murthy from Toronto, University of Toronto. Uh, in, uh, uh, firstly, I'm fascinated by this idea that Chinese philosophy doesn't really have an epistemology. Uh, I've heard that before, but I don't know too much about it. I really like, also like the idea that we try to understand uh, better our own philosophies or philosophical uh, uh, um, perspectives through uh, a, a comparative or uh, a joint study. I like the idea of the world philosophy. Yes, yes. Um, yes. But, but you see, in, 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 Indian, sorry, oh yeah, in Indian philosophy, there's a concept of of epistemic limits, that is limitations of knowledge, that the, the mind through which we gain knowledge uh, is not capable of crossing certain boundaries. So there is a, uh, in, in various schools like Vedanta, it is called Maya. Now the question I want to ask is, is there any such equivalent concept in um, uh, the Chinese tradition? It can't be a word direct correspondent because there is no epistemology, but is there some correspondent to that? Because the limits knowledge. Well, here is where, again, world philosophy comes in to the rescue. Because I'm not aware of this in Chinese philosophy, but did you know that in Western, recent Western philosophy, that very idea has become very, very prevalent? There's something called the new mysterianism. Mysterianism. And Colin McGinn, M-C-G-I-N-N, -N, is one of the practitioners. And they argue that human beings, through their evolution, have a limited capacity to understand reality. And so there are certain questions we're just not going to be capable of answering. Now, that's not exactly the same as mine, but it's rather similar. Okay, so the, in the West, there has been a strong tradition of, and, and I say recently it's revived by McGinn and others, of mysterianism, that the world is beyond us in certain important ways. So, so this is a contemporary problem? Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. All right, thank you. I want to introduce myself as, as a Makaran Paranspe. I'm the director of this Institute of Advanced Study. I just wanted to say thank you so much for getting to your office so early in the morning to talk to us. We really appreciate it. It has been a very rich sharing. And I hope that uh, you come here to Shimla someday whenever it's convenient to you. You're cordially invited, as well as to request you if uh, uh, Dr. Chakravarti plans a volume on virtue ethics as a part of world philosophy, a 
dialogue across continents and <coughs> cultures and traditions. I hope that you will uh, honor us by uh, you know, giving us a paper, giving us a slice of your very rich load of thinking on this uh, L-O-D-E. On this yes. oh, I, oh, I, thank you, yes. No, and thank you for your kind, kind, kind comments and your welcoming remarks. Uh, I will promise hereby to contribute to that volume. If there's going to be a volume, I want to be part of it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And thank you, thank you for your kind attention, too, all through today's session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye. 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 Alex? <laughs> so tomorrow we meet at what time? 9.30. Oh, wow. Look at you philosophers raring to go. 9.30 Okay, let's make this announcement. There's another Skype presentation tomorrow at around... No? Yeah. Okay, 9.30. 9.30 if you want to listen to Dennis Whitmer, right? At 9.30 tomorrow. Have a lovely night. I do 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 I Excuse me, everybody. There is another Skype presentation tomorrow. So we assemble here between 9:30 and 9:40. What's the topic of that? Well, that's um, already there in this. I think in this schedule. It is uh, a business um, um, school. Professor, he is talking and he is going to share with us as, uh, his experience of uh, teaching um, business school students virtual for business transactions and all. should be here. I can't. And by yes. the way, can you hear me okay? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. If I please. Okay, if I break up, I'm, I want you to let me know if I break up from something so we can oh, keep the conversation. I'm sorry, you will be concentrating on Aristotelian virtue ethics. We might like yeah. to add a little bit there from the Eastern perspective. There is no clash. Yeah. Well, we want to be complementary to each other. It's not you yes, and me. It's not you and us, but we all together. One thing Amen. <laughs> I totally agree. So tell me, just before we begin, a little bit about the participants <laughs> um, who are there. Who am I speaking to? Um, I have... Uh, <clears throat> Well, um, uh, well, they are basically. Um, uh, oh, Ananda. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hello, guys. Hello. Okay, this helps me. That's wonderful. Okay, that's good. Uh oh, excellent. Okay, I wish I were there uh, with you all today. Um, I'm very honored to be asked to participate, I must say. And um, indeed, when I looked at the composition of the people that were, I was humbled by the philosophical depth of uh, 
all the participants. And as I read a little bit more well, about what you... I'm sorry, most of them are um, um, well, professors from different corners of India. Um, and there is one among us who is from Hawaii uh, joining us on Virtue Ethics, Indian Virtue Ethics. Hello, Dennis. Hello. Hello. I, I am the secretary here in the Indian Institute of Advanced Study. So nice to see you and welcome to this seminar. And we really uh, hope that uh, we uh, get a lot of value from your interaction. We have been looking forward to it. In fact, the director, Professor Makaran Pranjapi, has been really yeah. excited to see you. He yeah. will be here any moment soon. However, <laughs> welcome, welcome to IIAS. Well, I, I'm, I'm honored to be with you, and I hope I learn uh, as well as we go along. And you know, I'm, I live in the mountains, uh, so I am speaking to you from a mountain region in Colorado. But I have never seen the Himalayas, so I only wish I were there with my wife. So. Yes. <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Dennis. I must soldier too, so I have always been to Himalayas, and in fact, uh, almost 18 years I've been in Himalayas, some part or the other. So welcome, I will be able to take you to some of the remotest places which are inaccessible to other civilians. <laughs> <laughs> we'll look forward to that. Um, I wanted to make just a few other preliminary remarks, and uh, also we go on. Uh, I must tell you that if you have um, perspectives that you'd like to share, I really would prefer that this be a discussion because I have a great deal to learn from all of you. And I'm going to throw out a challenge here to you at the end of my brief introductory remarks. Um, so you'll have to kind of wait for that. But um, I'm an educated person, but when I re read what the theme of the uh, seminar was or the conference, I felt like that I was an ignorant, educated person because I know so little about the Hindu tradition um, or the Indian tradition, especially as it relates to some of the things I care about, which is uh, virtue ethics. Um, and I also wanted to add just a, a, a couple of personal notes, if you'll forgive me. Um, but I have not seen Sisson Su since um, graduate days, probably. 74. Um, 74 was the last time. But that would be 45 years ago, I guess, yeah. maybe. Yeah. And um, I have to say, that what my recollections were, Sitan Shu was a person who exuded a calm. When I was, when our family was around him, he exhibited calmness. And I have come to find, correct me if I'm wrong, that that is actually what your name means, calm. <laughs> Google cool. tells me it's true. So, and, and um, you know, as I read about harmony within and the Indian tradition around understanding virtue starting with harmony within, um, I felt like you were that kind of person. Um, I would also say that his dear wife, Rena, was in the same field as my wife during the graduate school days. Yeah. And that, um, so both husband and wife had a commonality. And of the, the children, Rupu was the older, am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. And um, I remember her as a joyful little girl and Ananda as a very small little child before the last time I knew him. Yeah. And, uh, or met him, and here they are, accomplished adults. You must be very proud uh, of them, and uh, 
I just wanted to say that it is so wonderful to renew a relationship because we're getting old enough that that means a lot. Dennis, let us, we are calmly waiting for you. There are two special persons here. One is Ayan Maharaj. He is a graduate from University of California, Berkeley, but he is in the monastic tradition here at Ramakrishna Mission. The other one is Professor of Mathematics, a renowned Professor of Mathematics. Uh, internationally renowned uh, Professor Kumar Murthy, and he is joining us in virtue ethics here. So we are okay. waiting for your delivery. Okay, and uh, just one more, I have to throw out the challenge here to you, um, which is, as I was reading this, I realized that the approach that I use in the West is very much what I would call other-facing. Um, so the virtues um, that we discuss are about relationships with others. That's primarily what I teach in the context of business students, is what are the virtues that are required of a business person as she, he or she relates to customers, employees, the community, even the environment. But that's all other facing. And I read your theme with Harmony Within. It is very much inward facing to begin. So I recognize that. And in fact, uh, the closest that I get to, to that would be having my students think about um, what their core personal virtues are. Um, are the ones that they least would want to compromise in their relationships with all others. So I don't get to that harmony within. And here's my challenge to your group who is uh, there today. As, as I would go through this quickly for you to just show you how I teach virtue ethics, um, I want you to be thinking about how you can help me understand the Indian tradition and what harmony within means. In addition, what ideas would you have in the context of how I teach to advise me on how I could teach that to Western business students? So. I, I just want to give you that request and perhaps a challenge. Okay, so if you would like to go through the slides, I can do that quickly. Um, so this research, and if you have the slides up there, is that right? You can see the slides. We're we're getting them up. We're getting them up okay. momentarily. Okay. Great. So. Um, I, I put together a little talk that is um, not theoretical, nor is it um, empirical in the sense of any studies related to virtue ethics, but rather it's pedagogical. So my modest contribution here would be one of telling you over my last 25 years, 30 years, how I, how I ended up teaching virtue ethics to a wide variety of populations. And I've written a couple of articles. I've sent um, these to your folks at the Institute, and I'm happy that they be shared um, if you're at all interested. Okay, good. So do you still see me okay there? We're good, go ahead then. Ah, okay, very good, okay. Yes, I have that. So you will be advancing them, right? Yeah. Will, will you advance we will, we will. slides? With your direction. Okay. 
Okay, so I'll just say maybe next or something like that. Yeah. Um, so this is the first article that I wrote where uh, it really summarizes uh, what I'm going to talk about today. So if you want a, um, a publicate, uh, and I sent those out, so you're uh, welcome to read them at your leisure if you should you wish. But th that is a summary of what I'll talk about today. Next, and then there's an article as well that I uh, recently uh, playfully uh, did. If you want to go back to uh, the previous slide. Yeah, and it's my attempt to write a Platonic dialogue, and the only one that I've ever written, and it's uh, the main character with Socrates is Agoricus, and it's all about trying to uncover what the virtues are of a good business person. I certainly enjoyed uh, writing this, and it was actually dedicated to um, my first uh, philosophy professor, now he's uh, gone, but he um, was someone who um, instilled the passion for philosophy, and so um, I dedicated this uh, uh, dialogue to him. Okay, next. And so the uh, purpose of what I'd like to share today is this pedagogical approach and I've taught this to a variety of audiences over the last 25 to 30 years. Um, uh, undergraduate and graduate students, these are all in business, but also executive and professional audiences. We have a variety of executive uh, programs, our executive MBA and others. So um, it, it has been an approach that I think is intuitive and resonates well with the business audience. Okay, next. So for me, why business and business education is next? Go ahead to the next one. And you know, I, I started my graduate work in philosophy, but I always had two passions that were driving me. Um, one related to philosophy, but the other related to psychology. And so both strands of those are still alive since I do a variety of uh, uh, work related to uh, some theoretical and empirical work on decision making and management. Um, but some would say I went to the dark side um, by leaving philosophy and, and moving to the business uh, school and the business realm. But for me, it opened up the world uh, because Business is where is an institution where the greatest change is likely to occur. Government, yes, but uh, business has the uh, the largest potential impact in terms of um, impacting our our earth, and so that's why I am there. Next, and those who are going to be leading those organizations are ones that. Um, I am teaching, and in particular, how they lead those organizations uh, matters a great deal in terms of whether their uh, organizations are ethical or not. And so that's how I ended up um, uh, in business. Okay, next. And I'm going to just quickly run through. Um, by the way, time-wise, uh, what do we have here? Uh, what, what should I be looking at? What should I be planning for? Uh, you have uh, uh, leave, leaving out roughly 10 minutes for discussion. You have about uh, 25 minutes uh, okay. to get acquainted with your thoughts. Okay, okay, good. Okay, I'll keep an eye on that, 35 minutes. Yeah, that should be uh, uh, plenty, because I want to leave more time for discussion and sharing of, of thoughts. Um, so, so my approach is simply to start students in terms of thinking about what they consider important virtues. I'll go through how I do that. I also have a study done 
that compares the class results to some national samples done in the U.S. I don't believe it's been done globally. And then I bring in good old Aristotle as trying to introduce the students to classical thinking and how it's relevant today. And then I apply it to a particular business case that my daughter and I actually wrote and published. And I'll save a discussion of that case, but it has a very dramatic impact on the students. So next. This is a brief framework that I use for the first half of the 10 week. And it's my rough sketching of how I approach what they are learning overall in the ethics class. Right now I use in two classes. One is business ethics to social responsibility. So both of those strands, and that's an undergraduate course. And then I teach a graduate course in ethical leadership in particular. And so each course is a bit different, but both courses introduce students to this framework. And so I define ethics as simply the critical study of morality. Morality being the gift that we all have some system or framework of morality. And ethics is critically thinking about that. And then for several weeks we spend it on the normative side where they are introduced and use consequentialist thinking and duty based thinking and then also virtue ethics. I also spend a brief amount of time introducing them to some of the behavioral research related to ethics in the organization. And actually that's a lot more complicated than the little diagram here. Because some of the most recent interesting work that's being done is in the area of moral psychology with Joshua Green and Jonathan Haidt in terms of social intuitionist theories. It relates to the trolley problem that goes back to the days that I was a graduate student when Philip Afoot wrote that trolley problem as a hypothetical philosophical issue. And now of course it's a real live issue with autonomous cars in terms of programming how a car is going to respond when it confronts a number of individuals who might be in the road and whether it's going to be diverted from its route. So I do spend some time on the behavioral side. And in fact I'll be doing a PhD seminar in the winter quarter where it will almost exclusively be focusing on all the social research related to ethics from a behavioral standpoint. Oh, next. And so conceptually I start with a very old classical definition of virtue. The excellence of a thing that makes it what it is, that is according to its own nature. And so the virtue of an eye is vision to see, the virtue of birds flying, and a knife to cut in humans. Humans are more complex obviously. And I introduce at least the question about whether rationality is the defining condition for humans. But Erite is where we begin. And next. So here's where I begin with the students. I have them discussion prior to class, share their ideas with one another about how they define or the most important qualities or attributes of a good person, manager, or leader. And then they come into class. I divide them into groups. And those groups come up with 
those where there were there is consensus in the group so we build a list i do this in the white board um of uh what the class considers important attributes for each of these um functions um these each of these uh roles if you will and then next i uh i have them do a little survey from the book credibility by kruzis and posner um they have written uh several leadership books the credibility is a book related uh, concerning what makes credible or believable leaders and they have done a survey of uh, if you go to the next slide too you'll see the list of, of the other virtues or qualities these these 20 are available to the students without these percentages and i asked the students to complete the survey and then you'll see that second column is where i list the percentages of the uh, of the class and we talk about how the class compares to uh, these national samples that have been done uh, probably every five years since the 1980s okay next so what falls out of that discussion is that um, these top four qualities and invariably by the way the students uh, responses are very consistent with the samples that have been done of uh, managers and leaders uh, in business and so you'll you'll see that in this case honesty and competency are always uh, two of the top four but they are both what we would expect in leaders and in colleagues compared to um, two that change we expect our leaders to be inspiring and forward-looking and uh, with our colleagues of course something different we want them to be dependable and some people that people even work with cooperative so we begin to get uh, the idea of uh, virtues relates to these attributes okay next let's see where we are here uh yeah and then i um this little chart is actually uh, one that I created and compiled from book two of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. And, uh, you know, I provide this for the students as not a comprehensive list, but a list of how Aristotle would approach thinking about virtue. Um, of course, Aristotle thought of virtue as a disposition to choose the mean, to find the balance point, to find um, the moderate uh, course of action, um, that second column. And I bring the psychology in because I think it's important for students to understand that all of these um, qualities flow from our natural condition. Um, we will all experience, for example, uh, unless you're not really a human, some, at some points, feelings of fear and conflict. And I talk about how that was with the ancient Greeks, of course, mostly thought of in the context of war, battle. But uh, it, it pertains to each of us in our ordinary lives. Some people are very fearful of speaking in public. And so they confront the issue of feelings of fear and confidence in a different way than is a person in battle. And so I, I spent some time going through the table, trying to get them to understand this, talking about the, the vices uh, as the extremes. And then um, with all of that as a background, oh, the next, next slide that I, I just simply, uh, oh no, back, I think there's one before that. No, let's see. Oh yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, next. Now you'll get to hear about the case I use. So, uh, at that point in the gut, students are pretty familiar with what this means. And I give them 
a case that I wrote that has two parts to it, essentially. One that I give them to work on and read before class. Then the second part is one that I pass out. The epilogue, really. If I can interrupt you for a second, please. You were wondering how many within fixing here. I mean, I will just put a little slight suggestion. As Dominic Barton, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. As Dominic Barton says, the prime requisite in the business leader today is character. And character also certainly has a psychological dimension, as you mentioned. And good manager presupposes a good person. And virtue being a character state. How many within? Well, self-control is a prime requisite for honesty. And how does self-control take shape without harmony within there? So harmony within goes to build character in the long run. And that's the beauty I find of it. And this is how the Indian tradition can link to it without supplanting the whole thing, but supplementing. Well, go ahead, please. Okay, so self-control is the key, one of the keys, is that right? Yeah. In order to acquire, yes, yes, that makes a lot of sense. Self-control would be one of the, that's one way I could bring that out. The inner harmony as a function of self-control, I guess. It's a prerequisite for self-control. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So should I proceed? Yeah, please, go ahead. Okay, good. So the case that I give them is about a real business person in Denver, Colorado, who was running a distribution, drinks, beer, and beer in particular, but also soft drinks. Someone who was selling, and he was the largest distributor in the metropolitan area of Denver. And he had been very much wanting a customer, one of the supermarket chains. And he was in financial distress because of some decisions he had made. And he had a request from this organization, this supermarket chain, to deliver 750 cases of beer. And without thinking, he said, yes, for sure. And it was over a holiday weekend. And in Colorado, we have a law that only, we did have a law, that only supermarkets could only sell beer that contained less alcohol. And the beer that he had in his stock, only half fit that description. And the other half was a stronger beer that in Colorado, our liquor stores can sell. I hope this isn't too confusing, but it is a decision. The business person decided what he ended up doing was re-stamping the strong beer as weaker beer. And shipping it out to his customer. And one of his employees, who he rather foolishly fired for some reason, ended up blowing the whistle on this and going to the authorities. And it hit the newspaper, and he faced a very serious problem that ended up with him losing his liquor license. So 
and his business then was in real trouble. So I have students read this case and dig into it, and then I ask them in small groups to talk about this person, Joe Sullivan, who is the CEO and leader of the organization, in terms of the qualities and attributes that he exhibited in the case from an Aristotelian perspective. So I ask them to include all of his virtues and all of his vices, if you will. And it turns into a very, very good discussion. And then we go back, actually, to the discussion of leadership, because he made this decision by himself rather than consulting others. And so he exhibited a certain kind of hubris, a certain kind of arrogance, probably stemming from fear of various sorts. But without going into too much detail, the case is a discussion point to apply everything that we've been talking about in terms of leadership and management and being a good person. And then I pass out the last part of the case to the students. And it has a very tragic ending, where he ends up committing suicide because he's lost all of his business. And he has a very large family of eight children, and he commits suicide. And so that has a very, very huge impact on the students in terms of what might appear a very small mistake and result in disastrous consequences. So, okay, that's the case. And that's essentially the model, the module that I use on virtue ethics. And then if you go to the next slide, I'll just quickly summarize. Oh, yeah, you just have to keep clicking until you get the whole slide up. And this is my little model. After we do Joe Sullivan, I review Aristotle. And this is my model for thinking about how his approach is different from the utilitarians and Kant. I actually frame consequentialism and duty-based ethics as giving different decision rules when it comes to confronting ethical problems. You know, our business students learn all kinds of decision rules for a variety of things, whether it be in accounting or finance with return on investment, et cetera. So I say, wouldn't it be nice if we had a decision rule in ethics? And so I go through the other two models and then end with virtue ethics as a completely different framework for thinking about ethics, not from a decision-making point of view, but from establishing character and the virtues that go with it. Okay, so that's the next one. And then I simply give them the Aristotelian definition of virtue. And then we talk about, okay, next slide. I hope I'm not proceeding too fast here or too slow, but next one. That's simply, you know, is Aristotle's definition that it stems from the sitantu was saying a state of character. So it is about achieving a good character, if you will. And I do emphasize the, well, it'll come up in the next slide. So let's go ahead with, go ahead to the next slide. And then we talk about, well, how do we get these virtues? And Aristotle, of course, that is through practice, it's not innate. And then I talk about, it's all the little decisions that we do form us. And so a person with a strong character, moral character, if you will, 
doesn't have a real dilemma when they confront a difficult situation because their character has been established through practice and habit. And next slide. And then I talk about this woman in particular who was a whistleblower from some years ago who actually wrote a book about her experience. Do you know the MCA WorldCom scandals? It was in the era of Enron. It was a financial scandal of its time. And she was the lead auditor for this very large company and was aware that the financials were not accurate and tried to go through the board and they did not listen. And so she collected information and eventually blew the whistle. And so this is a quote from her book that if we practice finding our courage in the small matters each day, we'll stand a better chance of keeping the courage of conviction when it comes to the crossroads, more critical decisions. And when she was on campus, I had the good fortune to have dinner with her. And I asked her, you know, about the decision that she had to confront because this company, by the way, was located in a relatively small town in Mississippi. And if she blew the whistle, it meant that a lot of her friends and family were going to lose jobs. And so I asked her, wasn't this a difficult decision? How did you work through that when there's such powerful forces were against you? And she said, my mother always taught me from when I was very young. She said, Cynthia, never be intimidated by power. And so she spent her life practicing that. And when it came to the more difficult decisions, she she wasn't conflicted. She knew exactly what to do. OK, so that's the example. The next. OK, next slide. And then I talked a little bit about character as it relates to what we normally say when someone is has been told by another person that one of their friends, for example, was dishonest. And it's one of their their friend. What would you say? And to demonstrate character, essentially, I get them to think about how we would say that's totally out of character. That couldn't be Joe. That's not the person I know, because that act is inconsistent with the quality and the character of the person that they that they experience. OK, next. I do spend a little time after in this debriefing also about Aristotle as a contextualist, not a relativist. And by that, I mean that for Aristotle, applying these virtues is a trick. It's not necessarily easy because it all depends on context, the time, the place, the person, the situation in terms of deciding what is appropriate. And I use examples for about my wife, for example, you know, if she were to buy a dress and ask me if she came home with this purchase that she's proud of. And she says, what do you think of my dress, dear? And so what do I say? If honesty is the best policy and honesty is a virtue, do I tell her the truth? And of course, we we find ways of conveying the information depending on our relationship, depending on the situation. So we go into a little bit of a discussion how important it is to think about virtue being applied in context. OK, so I can see I need to run along here because the 35 minutes is disappearing. So let me next. 
They talk about uh, cardinal uh, virtues, and uh, my dear philosopher uh, undergraduate um, at least taught me that, that the, the, mo the, mo the best among the Greek virtues was sophrosune, or balance, or temperance. And excess in terms of hubris um, was was the ver worst. And I have the students start thinking about, for them personally, what are the the most and least uh, qualities that, that um, they would uh, want to, not want to compromise. Okay, so jump ahead, and um, you know again we talk a little bit more about what uh, core virtues, the ones that uh, are the foundation for the others. Go ahead and next. And I talk about um, was that courage, not temperance, but courage was the most important, that he thought it was the foundation of, of everything. Okay, next. And uh, I quickly go through some who have actually done either theoretical writing, like Robert Solomon on the qualities and, uh, of a, a business person, but also some social scientists who have studied this <coughs> by uh, talking to other, uh, uh, doing surveys and discussing with, with uh, subjects, and they come up with these, this list, this particular list uh, of the core virtues. Okay, next. You'll have these, so you can uh, you can peek at them again. And yet others, um, James Autry wrote extensively about servant leadership, and so these for Autry were considered to be um, the most important um, as it related to, to leaders, in particular in business. And then we've talked about Kuzis and Bosner already, so next. Next slide, thank you. And so, I get them to start thinking about uh, this, and I won't go into this, but my dialogue, Agoricus, raised the whole question uh, is around what what are the qualities of a good business person? And Agoricus is a young man who's just starting his business career, and Socrates comes in and pushes him to think about what are uh, the most important qualities. And they go through this list and the next list. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, in different ways, Socrates finds that each of them are important, but don't really get at the critical element of what is business is about. Okay, and the next slide. And then I get them to think about this really, for me, raises uh, the issue of professionalism in business and the essence of business to produce something of value for the customers and others. Who, I would change this to stakeholders now, but out of care and concern for their happiness and welfare. Okay, next. Uh, I, I want to skip that one because I don't think it's so critical here. And so then I turn back to uh, their personal values after we've explored this in a business context. And go ahead, next. So I say, what are, what are the things that you uh, least want to compromise? What are your core personal values? What are the, those that are uh, your guiding principles? And I want them to personalize this exercise. So one more slide. Go ahead. And what what are the ones that uh, you would least want to compromise? That's that's the one. And I call this um, as the slide before said their wallet values. And so what I do is pass out blank business cards and some transparency paper. Um, and I ask them if uh, this is kind of a voluntary thing. I don't, I don't check them on this, but I tell them that uh, I'd like them to think about what are the key values and virtues that they would least want to compromise, that are most dear to them. 
and write them on a card, laminate them with that plastic, and stick it in their wallet. And I bring out my own card uh, to show them that the professor does it as well. And so, I, you know, I think that that's as close as I get to trying to um, to make it truly personal and meaningful for them. Okay, next slide. Um, one more critical oops, uh, one more critical part doing business in life. Let's see where that goes. Go ahead. Oh yeah. So here's where I kind of end. This sounds like a lot for a two-hour session. <laughs> it's more than two hours. Um, and bring in the Greek concept of practical wisdom of phronesis. And um, actually, that is one of the outcomes for my teaching business ethics with students that I try to use as a goal. My goal is to help them become a little bit better as decision makers or informed decision makers as they move from being a student to being pra practitioners in the business world. And um, I use, you, you all may not know the movie Sophie's Choice, but it is the movie that featured Meryl Streep in World War II Nazi Germany. And at one, in one scene in the movie, she has her two children um, on her, one on each hip, and they are in front of a train car, and the Nazi um, soldier says, choose one or they both die. And that is the worst kind of decision that any human being would ever have to make. And, but it's an either or. You can't find a middle ground. And then we talk a little bit about s some ethical choices are like that. <coughs> Often, someone who's confronting the issue of whether to blow the whistle or not is confronted with an either decision. But more often, you can find a better way a creative way of balancing all the obligations. And then I argue that practical wisdom is that capacity uh, to do that. Okay, so move forward again, and we'll skip through these, because I think we're out of time, are we not? Yeah, are yeah. we out of time? Uh, okay. Yeah, well, uh, uh, we have to, this is the, uh, Unfortunately, the way of life anyways, we have to say uh, a stop at some point. Uh, yep. It's getting quite late for you at night. It's 11 o'clock now for you. Night woke me up, though. I'm all awake now. <laughs> all right. OK. There will be some other people who would like to have a few words with you. But before yeah. that, uh, just a small comment is as Burton, Dominic Burton, of the uh, the ex CEO of McKinsey, he says, "Who the leader is is more important than what he does. Actually, yeah. what he does comes from who he is, and courage, of course, relates primarily to uh, what is going to be done." Courage is important, but first the, the base has to be built, and not only in the business world, but for every walk in life. And that's what is emphasized by uh, Henry Widin. And if that's not there, the opioid crisis and all that, which uh, 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 plays havoc in society. Uh, so, um, uh, you are uh, very importantly uh, taking recourse to virtue ethics to to, uh, to let your course through. You contextualize and not relativize. You are not a relativist. I'm happy to know that. Uh, well, um, yes, uh, 
but there must be the building block anyways. And it does not exclude the question. You are not saying, you are not acting as a monist like a deontologist will do or a contextualist will do. You are, you are a contextualist. So, well, that very much appeals to me personally. And one has the freedom to pick the specific virtue. But uh, that notwithstanding, the base has to be built, first of all. So this kind of pluralism is very much there in the, in the Hindu-Indian system. Uh, with those words, and thank you for your presentation and all that. And I personally uh, was, uh, I am richer you know, having listened to through, you know, what you uh, delivered. Anybody else? Sanjay, uh, please come. Huh? Please come. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, or anybody else? Yes. Please. Um, Dennis, go ahead. You, you were saying certain some things. Oh, me? Yeah, please. Go ahead. Well, I w would... I would like to be educated to the point where I could um, improve, if you will, um, if, if I could include something additional that would be useful for the students about what harmony within is and how I could try to instill that in students as a starting point, as you say. How do I include that in my teaching so that the students are exposed to that tradition? Well, there are two dimensions to um, answering to a question. One is what is harmony within, and the other is how to achieve it. Which yes. it takes the whole life to uh, achieve that. Uh, but. And one must be, the, both at the micro and the macro level, the society must be aware that it, it, the way it is going is not uh, the right way. And there is something basic needed. And that awareness uh, has to be uh, raised. Uh, okay, uh, there are others who will, uh, we're running, going to run short of time, unfortunately. Yes. But, yeah, so somebody, uh, some other people are here. Let me, let them uh, be here. Can you hear this microphone? Yeah, both sides. Mic sound function. Mic sound. Yeah, sound. Well, Dennis, this is uh, Shantaram Mukherjee. I had been in yeah. the, uh, I have been in the field of ethics and values for the last 26 years. And uh, personally, uh, from Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta. Initially, I taught there for about 16 years, and now in Indian Institute of Management, Shillong, northeast of our country. Uh, I'm okay. teaching business ethics, CSR, wisdom leadership, etc. My questions are, uh, how do you differentiate between these three, values, virtue, and ethics? First. Uh, well, you know, as I, I said, I start with ethics, broadly speaking, as um, the study of morality. Um, and in the case of business ethics, it's simply the applied study of ethics in a business context, uh, just like engineering ethics would be applied uh, in, that, in a different context in medical ethics to different set of problems. So. Um, you know, I define that uh, very broadly. Um, one of my dear colleagues, now retired, um, used to teach with me, and he defined ethics as the application of value to human experience. So I think we all have our um, different um, takes uh, on different definitions of, of ethics, but that's how I approach it. Um, and the, what was the other, the other two values? Virtue. Oh. 
I use it in virtue, and I, I uh, think of values um, as things that we hold dear, things that are dear to us. Okay. So, to uh, for humans to value um, um, money or uh, love or friendship or whatever, things that we hold dear to ourselves um, have value. Um, and, you know, that, that, that we have to go from there. But anything we hold dear, whether it be aesthetic values or ethical values or political values, but those things that a human community or an individual holds dear. In virtues, you know, I don't get much further than good old Aristotle, probably, as a disposition of character. It is a disposition of character yes. to behave in certain ways. Yes. It's and a disposition, yes. A disposition and character state. Yes. That's how it is yes. defined in modern literature. Virtue is that. Yeah. Uh, yes. Quickly, I would uh, go to the last uh, point you mentioned. Uh, adherence to the core principles, but still making it creative and innovative. Uh, how, how do you go about that? Briefly, please. So, one more time on the question. Didn't quite... Adherence to the core principles, but at the same time, being creative and innovative, that's a challenge you mentioned in one of your last slides, right? Oh, yeah. Yes. So, how? How do you do that, that in your pedagogy? I think that is by using cases and discussing how, what those solutions are. How do you hold true to your principles, but at the same time um, accommodate um, others? So I, I almost every day, when we, we do a variety of other uh, issues in, in my class around uh, things like privacy in the workplace, and sexual harassment, and whistleblowing, and every day we do a business case. And each one of those cases lend themselves from multiple points of view and then having students think about what are the core values here that uh, should not be compromised. And in fact, I do a, a brief uh, module on global ethics and that's where it really gets interesting and comes out. And I use um, a piece by Tom Donaldson, who's a business ethicist, uh, doing business globally and what those core values are. And so, um, uh, in a global context, uh, we talk about companies, uh, not just individuals, but companies having um, those core values, ones that they are not going to compromise, and then uh, applying them in different contexts. So it might be gift giving in Japan, for example. Uh, you know, distinguishing bribery from gift giving. Um, and applying um, the principle of fairness, but one that accommodates cultural differences. So yeah. that's a, a, a beginning, perhaps, in response to your question. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, I, I have a very small question. You have talked about virtues and the positioning of virtues. I was wondering, uh, whenever there is a conflict of virtues, just like, for example, a justice and a kindness, loyalty and a fairness, so how do you decide about where to go and how to position yourself? Thank you. Um, so you mean just kind of generally loyalty and, and fairness? Justice and kindness, loyalty and fairness. Now if you have to yeah. position yourself in between four virtues. Uh, you know, I, um, I, I remember one, one case that uh, a case that was written up had to do with um, a person who has loyalty to the company because they are working in uh, an HR capacity and all information is to be maintained confidential. And they discover, this is a true case, that the list, the, on a list of layoffs that will be um, forthcoming, I think it was on a Monday, where it included one of their best friends. 
in fact it was a friend who helped them get the job and their families are very close and so the conflict was between loyalty to the company versus in this case well it was perhaps loyalty to a friend not so much fairness but that usually brings out a good discussion about there is no simple formula that which of those has more priority and I guess it's it's which is the now we're back to using duty it's a little bit which has the higher priority in terms of ordering those duties if you want to put it that way which will and then of course you have to start thinking about the the harm that each course of action would entail and so it also brings around the utility of each of the frameworks rather than thinking about there's only one framework or one decision but each one of those requires a unique kind of decision and so I don't and it will those that went out it depends on the context again thank you Dennis thank you so much thank you so much and thank you from all of us here the Shetan Shida also joins us to thank you all it's been wonderful listening you through the Skype I believe it's quite late over there and we all thank you and from the IIS we thank you so much for joining us and hope we get you for other seminars as well it was it was it was so it would it was so delightful from my end I appreciate all of your attention and I hope I offered some modest information that might be useful thank you well that's that notwithstanding yeah certainly but what kind of I mean demand you made on you you had a long day you were giving so many courses and on that heavy load you took this call from us and we are very much thankful to say the least to you we appreciate this very much and well it well worth it for me okay all right we'll talk this is not the end of talk here today this is only the beginning we'll carry on take care and good night and give my best to all the family good night good night